Behind the Lens. This is our last show, last live show of the year. Adrenaline Radio is taking a holiday next Monday, so you'll be hearing hopefully our very first episode from January 5th of 2015 uh, in next week's time slot. And that'll roll you right into January 4th when we come back. Um, We started uh, 2015 with Sandy Powell talking costumes of Cinderella. We're going to start 2016 with Sandy Powell again talking the costumes of Carol and a lot of other things, including, you know, live guests. So big doings next year. But before we get to 2016, we're still in 2015. And uh, some of the biggest doings happened this weekend with uh, Star Wars. The world has finally seen it. Uh, And as of right this moment, uh, it has shattered every record that there is in cinema history. And... uh, nobody's laughing at my billion dollar the first week remark anymore. So we'll see how that plays out. Those of you still looking for Star Wars merchandise, I was actually out in the stores myself this weekend. Disney Store will pounce on you when you walk in the door because they have new merchandise that was was held back. They finally released it once the film opened. So you can get some beautiful collectible uh, Kylo Ren figurines demasked. Uh, There's some Captain Phasma. There's a lot of cool stuff. So with Christmas next at the end of this week, now's the perfect time to go stock up on some Star Wars. I, for anybody out there who wants to buy me a gift, I really want the Kylo Ren lightsaber. Just saying. Just saying. But for today's show, an amazing show to wrap up the year today. Uh, I am so thrilled that we're going to have Eddie Jemison joining us live at 11.15. You all know Eddie Jemison. Eddie Jemison has been around, uh, it, probably best known to most of you, either for, for his commercial work is on uh, television or for the Ocean's 11, 12, and 13 series where he played Livingston Dell, one of the 11, 12, and 13 Uh, Eddie has now moved into the director's chair with an incredible film that I really love uh, called King of Herrings. And we're going to talk to Eddie all about the film. It's also, it's in black and white. uh, And the group of actors in the film, uh, they're all longtime friends. And it is their camaraderie that really comes across and makes this script and the characters that Eddie has written come to life. So I can't wait to talk to him. And then we're going to hear from Nick Fitzhugh. Nick Fitzhugh is showrunner, and he is also the head of Red Red Fitz Productions. Their motto is human stories for a small world. One of those human stories that Red Fitz is telling right now, it's a six-part miniseries, TV miniseries, six episodes. They're each roughly six, seven minutes long. Uh, Christine Amanpour featured this series Uh, on her show on CNN. The series is called Conflict, and it takes a look at the work of six photographers around the world who who photograph conflict. And conflict is not, it's not combat photography. There's all kinds of combat, uh, all kinds of uh, conflict that we'll hear about uh, when uh, Nick calls in the, f- the photographers that the series focuses on, each one gets their own dedicated little episode. Uh, Peter Mueller, uh, Joa Silva. Now, Joa Silva may be familiar to a lot of you. Uh, he was part of the Bang Bang Club uh, that shot a lot down in Johannesburg in South Africa. Uh, his story and that of his co-photographers is part of this group, Kevin Carter, Ken Oosterbroek, and Greg Marinovich. It was made into a movie back in 2010, 
uh, based on Joe's book, and it starred Ryan Felipe, Taylor Kitsch, Mal- uh, Malin Ackerman, and Niels Van Jarsveld. So to see, to see and hear from Joe himself, who is now in the line of shooting conflict, uh, became by stepping on an IED is now a double amputee. So it this is a particularly powerful and moving episode uh, in the conflict series. Uh, there's also Donna Ferrato, who to her conflict is domestic abuse, sexual abuse, uh, and the psychology behind it. Nicole Tung, uh, who did a lot of photography, 28 years old, photographing in Libya and Syria. Um, Hers is also another touching story told through photos and her words. She was friends with James Foley, uh, one of the first journalists who was executed. Then there's Robin Hammond, who shoots in the Congo, uh, where conflict that comes out of war involves sexual violence. Um, the fi- each each episode is as powerful, if not more so, than the last. Um, stunning, stunning work. So I'm looking forward to talking to Nick about how he chose these photographers, where the idea for this series came from, and can we expect more like this from Red Fitz and from Nick Fitzhugh. So Nick will be joining us at the half hour mark, but... Before Eddie calls us at 11.15, let's talk about a film that's opening up this, on Christmas Day, The Hateful Eight. A lot of conflict right now over The Hateful Eight, uh, and it's quote-unquote road show. And that is what hits theaters on Christmas Day. The road show is the 70 millimeter screening of Hateful Eight. I believe it's at 98 theaters now throughout the United States. And as I learned in talking to one of the producers, Richard Gladstein, and you will hear excerpts of my exclusive interview with Richard shortly, Weinstein Company, who is distributing the Hateful Eight, they actually had to work with and build projectors and repair kits to distribute to theaters in which to show the Hateful Eight in 70 millimeter because there aren't 70 millimeter theaters anymore. Um, but trust me, once you see Hateful Eight in 70 millimeter, and anybody who can do it, do it, do it, because Quentin shot this in Ultra Panavision. Not only did he shoot this in Ultra Panavision, he shot this with the very same lenses that were used to shoot Charlton Heston in the Chariot Race in Ben Hur. Uh, Panavision had to reconfigure clean up, dust off. These lenses have all been around. They just have not been in use because of the format. The 70 millimeter format has gone out of vogue. Um, I, for one, having have had my love for 70 millimeter rekindled with The Hateful Eight. This is cinema. This is storytelling. When you want to make a movie on a grand scale, this is how you do it with 70 millimeter. Um, one of the things that 70 millimeter does, shooting in this ultra Panavision, Ultra Panavision allows you to have close-ups of both an actor in the foreground and the background in the same frame. So, And to see what Quentin does with that in terms of focus and how he directs the, the focus of the story, the POV, throughout the film, is it's quite interesting and it is quite magical to behold his eye and his sense of storytelling that really comes through with this ultra panavision uh so i strongly urge everybody when you can if you can see this in 70 millimeter that you don't want to miss that opportunity but the film is also going to be shown digitally digital cinema uh at most theaters but that is also cut differently than the 70 millimeter and i talked to editor fred raskin about that and we'll hear from him shortly but first We're going to start off, we're going to hear from the man himself and what he had to say at the press conference, at the Los Angeles press conference uh, about Hateful Eight, starting with shooting in 70 millimeter. Uh, uh, I remember when I uh, um, did the film, 
when it got when it was reported that I was going to do it in this format, people were actually I speculating, and I guess I understand it. They were like, "Well, yeah, okay, that sounds all really great, but why would he do it for a thing that's just so set bound?" And yeah, I think that's actually just kind of a, a, um, um, a, a not a very profound uh, thinking when it comes to uh, 65 millimeter. That it's basically just for shooting travel logs or shooting mountain sceneries or and uh, uh, nature and stuff. Uh, I actually felt that, especially in um, bringing it into Minnie's haberdashery, if the film isn't suspenseful i.e. the pressure cooker situation of what's going on in the movie, if that's not part of it, if uh, the threat of violence and the, uh, the pressure cooker situation isn't, is, if the temperature isn't always getting upped a notch uh, every, every scene or so, then the movie's going to be boring. It's not going to work. And I actually felt that uh, the, the big format would, one, it would put you in Minnie's haberdashery. You are in the, that place. You are amongst those characters. Uh, and I thought it would make it more intimate when I got in close with them. But the other thing that I thought would be very, very important is there's always two plays going on in this movie. Once you're in minis in particular, there's two plays going on at all times. There's the characters that are in the foreground of any given scene, and then there's the characters in the background. And you always have to be keeping track especially in this scenario of where everybody is. It's like they're, they're, they're pieces on a chessboard and you always have to see it. And so maybe it might be uh, uh, Chris Mannix and uh, uh, General Smithers who are dealing. But you're also clocking uh, 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 Joe Gage at his table and you're clocking John Ruth and Daisy at, uh, at the bar. And that, and that becomes important, unless I don't want it to be, unless I want to uh, uh, cut them out and not show it to you. But you, I think that helped uh, uh, ration up the tension as things went on. Yeah, and Quentin talks about one of the big set pieces in the film, which is Minnie's haberdashery. The film, you've got Minnie's, you've got exteriors up in snow country, real snow, not fake snow, and you've got a and stagecoach. Those are your three scenes, your three locations for this film. Minnie's haberdashery is absolutely exquisitely done. It was built from scratch. Production designer Yohai Taneda. Yohai was a production designer on Kill Bill. Uh, he's also done Man of Tai Chi, Flowers of War. I knew his work for his work as a production designer for Ghibli, for Studio Ghibli, for when Marnie was there in Ghost in the Shell. And what Yohai has constructed for the haberdashery, it is stunning because that is where 90% of the film takes place. And you have this cast of characters. You have the Hateful Eight and one spare uh, who's not hateful. It's poor Walter Goggins, who is the stagecoach driver. Uh, and everything unfolds. And there, are, you know, you've got Sam Jackson in there. Sam Jackson gets the bulk. He does the heavy lifting here with the monologues, very extensive monologues. And as we all know, nobody can do a monologue like Sam Jackson. But within that, because of shooting with the Ultra Panavision, because of the way the haberdashery was designed, we get to see reactions of people all in the same frame as Sam is talking. But one of the problems is because of the way Quentin writes, because of the way Quentin Tarantino shoots, typically shooting in film, you're not going to have film mags that are big enough to have these monologues that are six and seven minutes long. So... What do you do when you're Quentin Tarantino and you're going to shoot in 70 millimeter and you have very long monologues? You go to Panavision and say, what can you do to help me? I mean, the, uh, uh, Panavision came up with um, a 2,000 foot uh, mags, all right, where we were able to like shoot it for 11 minutes at a time, uh, which, I mean, I can't even imagine doing this material if we had to break it up in four minute goes. Uh, uh, we, had, we, we had to do it like that. I mean, the only real big limitation that I had as far as uh, my shooting was, uh, the wine scenes were, 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 were very generous with me, so I didn't have to dole out the footage in a certain way. I mean, I, I wasn't completely cavalier about it, but, uh, uh, but I didn't really change my shooting style for it, and that, that wouldn't have been the idea, is to completely change my shooting style, so I shot the way I wanted to shoot. As comes as no surprise. Uh, we're going to come back to Hateful Eight later on in the program, but right now... We have the fabulous Eddie Jemison joining us. Hello, Eddie. 
Hi, Debbie. How are you doing? I'm fine. It's so strange to be talking to an Eddie. My dad was an Eddie. My brother was an Eddie. My nephew was an are Eddie. Are you kidding? My dad was an Eddie, too. Oh, wow. And and called Eddie. It's a great name, Debbie. Eddie is a great name. Eddie is a great name. <laughs> And I have to say, I have been such a huge fan of yours for so long. Well, thank you. I uh, appreciate that. I mean, e- even the little, the, your, the littler roles that you've done over the years. Um, I loved you in Hung with Thomas thank Jane. Thank you. And, of course, you know, in the Ocean series, you're just a kick, a kick in the ass. Thanks, Debbie. I appreciate that. That's nice. But now, you blew my mind with King of Herrings. I, oh, this is, it is a character roller coaster ride that yeah. is so comfortable, but at the same time, true to life, explosive, emotionally explosive. We're not used to seeing guys, because this is really, it's male bonding, but then you balance the inanity of men with the, <laughs> with the beauty and this waifish delicacy that your real life wife Laura Lamson brings to the character of Mary. Oh, uh, that's great. I have to tell her that you said that waifish delicacy. That's she'll love that. I mean, she is like she's almost ethereal in this film. I know, I know. Her performance is the, the certainly the best in the film and 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 they're all good actors, believe me. Oh. Those guys are all amazing, but Laura kind of steals the film. And, you know, when I wrote it, I didn't think, I thought of it as an ensemble piece. Mm-hmm. I never thought of Laura's character being the main character that everyone would um, identify with. Mm-hmm. But something about the way she played it and something about my own stupidity when I wrote it, I didn't, I just didn't know. But it's clear when you watch the movie and when I first watched it at the New Orleans Film Festival mm-hmm. that she is the heart of the movie. Oh. Uh, without, and her performance is amazing. Without a doubt. Now, where where did this story come from? And for the listeners, you know, briefly... Give us a rundown of what it's about, other than men being being men, which every all it's I have about, to do. Every woman out there will understand that remark. Uh, it's about a group of friends, of men, male friends, two sets of them that come into two different camps, and they and because they have so many ego fights between them, they wind up using a woman as um, prize, not to see who can for there, but but sleeping with her would be great if they could, but just to kind of use her as a tool to see who as a trophy, like who has won, and they wind up, she's agoraphobic, she, she never leaves her apartment, she's very fragile, and they wind up kind of trying to get her out of, out of the house just so they can win. Mm-hmm. So basically, uh, to make it more simple, she's my wife, and my best friend, or my friend, to get back at me for disrespecting him, he tries to sleep with my wife just to prove that he can do it. Not because he loves her. But, of course, in the film, you don't know if do they really love each other. I, at least I, I hope that's what people think. Did you think that? That you maybe know, it was a real love affair? I think that, that Ditch and Mary really do love each other. They have a weird way uh, of expressing it. Oh, I meant the professor. Oh, and, the professor? No, the professor. Like, was I think... there at any point did you think maybe that there was really love there, or at least romance? I think she was more, not so much love, but I think romance, but the idea of ro- of the romance is what appealed yeah, to Mary. Yeah, romantic, and she wants to get out. I mean, when you're sitting there reading the little reader di- Reader's Digest stories, and you're hiding it in the couch so that di- so that her husband doesn't find it. You know, it gives it that little naughty sensibility uh, that is indicative of, you know, high school girls and, you know, somebody having, you know, thinking of having an affair or maybe in their mind they're having an affair. Really, really exquisitely posited on your part from the story construct. You. I mean, it'd be, well, what do you mean by, by positive? 
Oh, no, posited. A very, very, pos- oh, posited. Yeah. Exquisitely posited. Oh, yeah. golly. Well, thank you. Yeah. Now, what... I guess I know how it feels to to be a daydreamer and to read a book and think, if only my real life could be that way. And mm-hmm. you sort of You sort of go with someone thinking that and then wind up realizing... Life's not anything at all like the way it is in books. Mm-hmm. And, of course, part of the, the excitement here of Mary's character is the story that she's reading in the Reader's Digest. She doesn't get to finish because Ditch throws That's the right. Reader's Digest away. So it's That's right. it's very metaphoric for her own life as to how is her story going to end. Yeah. Wow, You're, you really watched it, didn't you? Oh, God, yeah. I've watched it three times already. What? Yeah. Thank you so much. That You know, that means the world to me, right? I mean, this is, I, it is so well done, Eddie, and not just from your story standpoint and from your cast and performances, but, you know, your the direction, you and your co-director, Sean Richardson, and then opting for black and white is so, was so smart of you. Because with black and white, you get all those shades of gray that every relationship in life has. You know, I thank you. I think the the fact that it was set in black and that it's set in New Orleans mm-hmm. and shot in black and white, those two elements gave it a an otherworldly feel that made it seem. And you tell me if I'm wrong, but it and it it gave a very low budget movie uh, a world to exist in, so that it doesn't you're not constantly reminded. Oh, it's like the real world, but badly shot, like so many indie films are. Instead, it gives it, oh, it's this odd corner of the world Mm -hmm. where anything can happen. It gives it a classic feel and a very timeless feel. (laughs) Yeah, we were shooting for that. Yeah, I mean, it's so, so well done. It's so talky, you know. We needed to, we needed to um, set it in a world where people could just talk and talk. And with the black and white, rather than color distracting people's, you know, taking away their visual senses with uh, pops of color here and there, you're more inclined to tune into the auditory, to the sound, and you'll hear the dialogue. But you're also going to hear Larry Blake's great sound design. I mean, you, oh, I know. He's amazing, isn't he? You've got the buzz and the hum of the crickets and, and the in and the little kikitas in the area at night. I mean, absolutely yeah. these little nuances that fill the film with texture. Well, those are the kind of movies I like anyway. I grew up watching, you know, black and white films on TV, and I particularly liked movies about set in the South. And, mm-hmm. and besides the black and white helps you not reveal who the redhead is because you can't see the color of anyone's hair. That's right. That's right. <laughs> now, that was just luck. What made you know that this was the time for you to jump behind the camera and direct? What made this the right time and this the right film? Oh, well, gosh. Um, I, you know, been living in sort of Hollywood now for, at the time I made the movie, maybe like almost close to 10 years. Mm-hmm. And um, I never got to be a part of a, an ensemble film. I mean, of course, the Oceans movies are ensemble movies, but I never got to be a part of an ensemble drama like I did when I was in theater. Mm-hmm. And these guys are all in the movie, are all buddies of mine from doing theater. And I just missed, I missed really acting, really sinking my teeth into something. And so I started writing this thing and doing it, <clears throat> workshopping it at a, at a weekly acting class. And people, we did one scene, and they're like, well, what happened? <laughs> and so I did the next week, the next scene, and it got to be like a serial. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to see how it played out. And once I was done, just, just wrote it for myself. Uh, my friends read it, and they're like, we got to do this, and you got to direct. And I, I never really had wanted to direct before, but I was the the only one who really knew the story, so I had to give it a shot, which is why I asked Sean to be co-director, because he, he's a great cinematographer, and I thought, I can't pay him, but we could at least share 
um, share directing the credit, yeah, part of it together. Yeah, like at least we, I can, we can do this together, and that'll be our payment because mm-hmm. no one made any money. We did it just for the creative fun of it. But you know, and films like this on these little films that pack such a punch as you have done here, you know, Thank it's you. they may not make the big dollars, but the quality of storytelling that is put out there Thank you, is Becky. worth to me as as you know as a critic and as a moviegoer and and, and somebody who produces and, and does production. I mean, that to me is invaluable. That means yeah. more. Thank you. Than the five hundred yeah, than the five hundred and seventy one yeah, million that Star Wars got at the box office. You know, I <laughs> <laughs> You know, the fact that it was in black and white, just that alone and the fact that it was an ensemble drama, mm-hmm. those two things that define it made, I'd say, 80% of the film companies not even, not even watch it. Yeah. They wouldn't even look at it because of those two, those two things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They're like, we're not going to watch a black and white movie about people. Like, give us something we can sell here. <laughs> But eventually someone did, and that was a Devolver, and they loved it. So you're right. Those two big-budget movies are so far away from this kind of movie now. When, when I grew up, these kind, this kind of movie that, that I made mm-hmm. would not have been that hard to sell. Or, or you know, the, the studios made movies like this. Mm-hmm. They did. But now there's a huge gap between what the studio makes and what indie filmmakers make. Mm-hmm. And it shouldn't, I don't think it should be such a big gap. No, there should I be. I think they're making a mistake, but there there's, you have it. And there should be a happy medium in there, and I don't think we have yeah. that. I think we're getting there because of filmmakers like yourself, because of stories like this. But mm-hmm. it's, it's, I think it's still going to take some time. To, you yeah, know. I do too. You know, TV's filling in the gap now. Yeah, oh, I know. Now, as directing, what did you find to be the most challenging aspect of stepping behind the camera? The most challenging aspect? I guess for, for me, um, I mean, technically, I mean, I'm just an idiot. I don't, know if, <laughs> I don't know anything about the technique of filmmaking. I love composition, but I don't know what which... Um, I don't know how to light things. That's why you have I don't Sean. know which <laughs> lens to use, you know? So for me, I relied completely on Sean for those things. Um, so that would be where I, I was most challenged, trying to, trying to come up to speed on the technical aspects of filmmaking. Mm-hmm. For me, um, you know, the thing that's most natural is how to direct actors and how to compose the shot and writing the dialogue and those kind of things that are much more about people. Mm-hmm. That, that was easier. And the acting part is, was fun too. That's not so hard. You just jump in and especially when you're acting with your wife, you know, I think that one scene that we did, the real dramatic one, mm-hmm. where we throw each other around. I think we did three takes of that scene. Wow. And we choreographed it probably in about, 15 minutes. Mm-hmm. Those things were easy. But when it came down to, like, say, when we were editing, I didn't know how to cut things together. I, I had to learn all that. Mm-hmm. So that was the hardest part. The stuff that people go to film school for that I didn't know. Yes, but you can. You know how to tell a story. You know how to, through your performance skills, you know how to bring a story to life. Well, thank you. I mean, that was all guesswork on my part, but thanks. I just got lucky. How how much how much comfort did it give you that all of your friends were there in this with you? Oh, that 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 gave me so much comfort because you know the actors not only did they act in the film, but we we were the crew as well. Mm-hmm. So we, you know, the uh, the guy who plays Augie in the film. One minute he would be um, adjusting a light. The next minute he would get, you know, get the um, marker and mark the tape. And then he would jump behind the counter and act. <laughs> and 
that kind of all of us pulling together like that disguised the fact that we were making something that was maybe could be construed as important. It just made it all fun. It, it was much more fun and kinetic that way. So having my buddies there made it made it um, less consciously about art mm-hmm. and more more about um, you know like putting together a, a collage. You know. Mm-hmm. Well, this if is that makes sense at all. Well, this is one be- things less precious. Well, I'll tell you. I've been on sets where you've got hundreds, hundreds, literally hundreds of people, and you do a take that's taken an hour and a half to light, and you walk in, and the first thing you think is, I better not screw this up. (laughs) And you think that throughout the whole, your whole performance. And that's the last thing you want to think about it, Mm -hmm. about. So when you're doing a movie like this, and you're running around and doing everything, by the time you, you get to the acting part, oh, like, that's the easy part. You, you don't even think about messing anything up. You just think about what you want to do. So the pressure's off. Mm-hmm. So now I know that King of Herrings is now available on, is it on Netflix, Hulu? Where can people find it? <clears throat> right now it's available on iTunes, Amazon, Amazon Prime, Google Play, and a host of other platforms. Mm-hmm. If you Google King of Herrings, you will uh, you'll get to see where it's, where you can connect to it. Well, because everybody should see this. I, it's I just think it is a fabulous, fabulous film, Eddie. And I hope Thank you direct you. another one. I hope you write and direct another one. Oh my gosh, this is so difficult. <laughs> I was I swore to myself I wouldn't do it again, but after this conversation, maybe I'll have to rethink that. I hope you. I, in all sincerity, I really <laughs> hope you do, because you have a gift. You have a gift for this. Thank you, Debbie. You're the best. That means the world to me. I I just I just I I just I have to watch the film again. As a matter of fact, can I call you at home? Yes. And, uh, you can tell me this. <laughs> Of course you can. <laughs> We're not giving Thank my you, home. Tim, ha- Tim has my phone number. <laughs> no. That was a joke. I would never bother you. Oh, I, Eddie. I so Eddie, appreciate this interview. Eddie, you can call me anytime. Seriously, I will tell Tim to give you all of my information. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. That would be my pleasure. My absolute you- privilege and, pr- and pleasure. Well, you, I'm a fan, and you're a lovely interviewer, so thank you. Well, thank you so much, Eddie, and I hope to talk to you. have a great day. You too, Eddie, and I'll talk to you soon. All right, cool. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Eddie Jemison, King of Herrings. And now we have Nick Fitzhugh. Hey, Nick. How are you? I am blown away by conflict. Well, thank you so much. I could not believe what I was seeing in each one of these six episodes. I knew about Joa Silva and, you know, the Bang Bang Club film that had been made. I actually Mm -hmm. did. I talked to all the actors and directors on that film when they did it. Um, But the other photographers, I had heard of Peter Mueller, but I was unfamiliar with the others. This is a spectacular little mini series. Well, thank you. I, I really appreciate that. Where um, where did this idea come from? I, mean, I love the whole idea of your company, Human Stories for a Small World. And if this mini series doesn't embody that very mantra, I don't know what does. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, it, it is it is sort of a, a guiding principle, although not uh, a rule, you know, that I follow with all the projects I conceive of and, and even take on. Um, and, you know, to answer your question uh, specifically about where the series came from, it, it is, there's sort of a number of, there's a number of ways of answering that question, but the, the main way that it came about was through my friendship with Pete uh, Muller. He and I had been friends for a number of years and uh, actually hired him to work with me on my first film called Soccer City, which we shot in township south africa during the first world cup in africa and it 
It really is about life and soccer in um, in the townships. And he had not really had any, at that point, really any experience with, um, with video uh, and filmmaking, but he was, uh, at that point as well, just a fantastically talented photographer who had done a lot of work in, in Africa, um, in Sudan, and South Sudan, and northern Uganda, and elsewhere. Um, and so I was just very familiar with his work and with his process and, and hugely admired him um, and his approach to his work, uh, which... You know, he really talks about it in his episode, but it stems from this incredible connection that he forges with everybody that he photographs. And he's able to build a real relationship, you know, based on trust uh, with with his subjects. And that's, that's fairly rare. Um, and then on top of that, he is very interested, as he says in, in his episode, in the conflict behind combat. So... Instead of sort of going to the front lines and taking pictures of bullets whizzing around and explosions and and that kind of thing, um, not that there is, I mean, that is an important thing for photographers to do as well. But he's much more interested in uh, in what's essentially behind those front lines, that the fallout. Um, and I think that's something that often isn't um, given enough attention in in the news. Um, so that that was fascinating to me, and I just felt that there was a really strong story. Um, to be told about the work that he was doing and his approach, and and I thought also that it, you know that it could become a series. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's you know it's rare that people have the opportunity to hear from the people who are actually uh, capturing these images and and sort of living these lives. It's and when you do, um, it's in a fairly uh, or sort of hopefully objective way. Mm-hmm. Um, and I like the idea that this could be very subjective, really based on experiences of people that um, you know, that we can begin to identify with. And, um, that's kind of where I began. Then how did you go about selecting, outside of Peter, then selecting your other five photographers mm-hmm. that you would focus, with each one having their own episode as their focus, and then their particular, dare I even say it, specialty of conflict? Mm-hmm. Because that's what I found extremely interesting. Um, you set the stage with episode, episode one with Peter, and who is very clear and very succinct in explaining that conflict and combat are two different things. And yeah. we, we then get to see that played out in each one of the subsequent episodes with each photographer. And what their idea, their conflict specialty is. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that was... After the initial idea with Pete, you know, what, what then became very, um, both, both creatively interesting and also just, I think, uh, what I felt was an important uh, thing to pursue within the context of the series was um, was was really looking at conflict itself and, and defining it broadly. Um, and I just thought that was just that much more important and interesting. And so... Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that was that was the goal in selecting other photographers. There are many, many, many people who are producing incredible work and often putting their lives on the line to do it. And uh, so deciding on these, these first initial you know, six photographers was very difficult. But um, but what was really guiding the way the entire time was uh, was looking for the most diverse group of people possible in terms of age and gender and region of the world or regions that, that they've worked in. And most importantly, that the type of conflict that they were capturing. Um, and you know, I think the clearest example as a uh, sort of differentiating between wars is the episode with Donna Ferrato um, when she covers domestic violence. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so then suddenly you start thinking about conflict is not just war, but um, you know potentially you know there's an episode about basically drug cartels and. Um, we didn't do one, but there could be one about prison, uh, you know, and there's there's one about rape, and there's one about loss, and um, and it just sort of goes, can go on and on. Um, mm-hmm. and, and I think it's really interesting to look at both what's similar and what's different between those forms of conflict. Now, something that's, that stand out with each one of the photographers, be it Donna Ferrato, be it Nicole Tong, Robin Hammond, uh, Iris Hoagland, or Joe and Peter, is they really open up themselves. Mm-hmm. It's not just their pictures that tell us a story 
we're now hearing their story, what moves them and what speaks to them. Did anyone have any kind of trepidation about revealing, you know, especially, you know, Nicole? I mean, Mm -hmm. she had me almost moved to tears when she was talking about James Foley. Yeah, I mean, that that moment, actually, I almost always um, tear up when I watch it, even now. Um, And there are other moments in, in in other episodes like that for me, too. And you're right. I mean, this, it, it couldn't have been, I don't think it couldn't have been nearly as powerful and as uh, successful a series if these uh, individuals had not opened up in the way that they did. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm very grateful uh, to them for doing that. Uh, and, you know, if, if you ask them, I think they would give you the same uh, same explanation that, that I will um, for, you know, what helped them do that and why they did that. And and one, and I think probably the the most important, is that they all recognize that they're essentially asking their subjects to do the same for them uh, when they're in the field and when they're taking pictures, even though those those people may not be speaking um, in in a way that's captured in film um, because they're they're still photographers. But you know, not all the same, they they really are asking these people to trust them, to allow them into their lives, to tell them their stories and allow them to to capture um, images that reflect that. And so I think they all feel that, you know, how can they not agree to the same thing, to Mm -hmm. the same request being made by somebody else? That said, they are very guarded about um, these experiences and and, um, and who who they share them with and how. And so it is also very important for me to do the same thing, to, to build trust with them and for them to understand that, you know, my interest is, is telling their story as accurately and honestly and, and powerfully as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, and and that was part of the process. I mean, starting with Pete, uh, who I'd known for a long time, he then helped introduce me to some other people, and some other people introduced me to other people. And that process lasted um, a few years, actually, wow. um, before I, I really had both made the selections for who we were going to cover and also built relationships with them that, um, that I thought were, um, strong enough to, to sort of move forward. Um, and that doesn't, I'm not saying that each of them took three years, but, um, you know, there, there are a couple of them that were much, much, much less time than that, Mm -hmm. but still, um, speaking with them beforehand and, and sort of being validated through other friends who knew them really well, um, and who trusted me, you know, that was all very important. And who was responsible for making the actual photographic selections uh, for each of the photographers that are included in the episodes? Because some of them are, uh, they're all absolutely stunning. Yeah, I mean, these, these people really are some of the best in the world. So the work that they're producing is, is pretty much all stunning, in, in my opinion. Um but it was, but we were the ones, um, myself, the producer for each episode, which sometimes was me and sometimes was uh, someone else that I had hired, uh, and the editor, um, were, were the ones primarily responsible for the photo selections. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and, and the photographers, you know, again, to their credit, had provided us with pretty much all the photographs that we, um, that we asked for, which, which in some cases was almost everything. And then we, we sort of wade through that and, and make decisions um, that we think are, are best for the story. Wow. Yeah, and some uh, you, you differentiate amongst all the photographers in the way that you actually do the live interviews with each of them. And mm-hmm. I found that, you know, that it's very striking that you do that so that some people then get lost in a myriad of looking at images. Mm-hmm. But then you have the real life moments of the photographer talking in each one you have lensed differently. Uh, Mm -hmm. You know, you have Donna sitting cross-legged in her living room, surrounded by, by photographs, Nicole walking through, you know, a, a beautiful, a dark, but beautiful industrial brick space Mm -hmm. telling her story. You know, Eros is out sitting, Hey, in the Mexican desert. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So we see, you know, these differentials. Did the photographers have any input into that, or was that something that you and the other producers arrived at for the storytelling? 
It, it was mostly something that, that we, decisions that we made, um, sort of behind the scenes and, and on our own based on the, the story we felt we were trying to tell for, for each of them before we went into the interview. And, and sometimes, you know, the interview, uh, we learned things in the interview that, that forced us to make some changes to not the location, but to uh, um, how we're telling the story because we're, we're at some, in some ways only really learning the story fully then. But it's really important to, to know as much of that as possible beforehand because a lot of these choices are, are choices that you, you make beforehand, like where we're shooting it. Um, and we did, we did interact with the uh, subjects as well uh, to some extent, both to sort of make sure that they were comfortable with the idea that we had uh, and, um, again, because this is, while cinematic and, and in some cases somewhat stylized, you know, this is very much a documentary. So, again, we're trying to tell the most um, truthful version of their, their stories as possible. And in the end, they are their stories, not mm. ours. Um, so we didn't want to go through a location if, if they felt strongly that it was ridiculous or wrong or something. Mm. But none of them did. And... Um, and so mostly what it came down to was was if they had specific ideas around the concept that we had. So I, I think one of the better examples was uh, Eros. And, and, you know, we said, look, we, we'd like to find an exterior location for you. We're thinking sort of in the middle of the desert or it could be in near a structure that is clearly in sort of the remote and, and sort of vast desert landscape. And, you know, you're the one who knows this area of Mexico best, at least much better than we do. So do you have suggestions? And he had some and we checked them out and, but ultimately we found the location we used just simply by kind of driving around and, and eventually spotting an area and then exploring that area and finding this particular spot. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, each of them are meant to reflect um, the photography that we're seeing. It's supposed to sort of feel like we're in the location with them as mm-hmm. opposed to, creating a very strong separation between their work and, and their interview, um, which, uh, which uh, Pete actually is a sort of the inverse example of, and that's partly because his was the first sort of the pilot episode, but also because I was very interested in his episode to sort of mash up him and his work. And, and, um, and a lot of it is, is some of it is, is fairly, um, uh, intellectualized, and, mm-hmm. and so it seemed to fit for that. Um, and then on top of that, we there was also some stylization we were doing with each episode in terms of pushing the the look of what we were shooting, not just the location, but also literally the the way we were grading the footage mm-hmm. um, towards the the uh, style of the photographer. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's probably most noticeably done with both both Robin Hammond's episode and Pizza Bit and also with um, with Eros's, uh, but we're also not trying to match it. It's mm-hmm. just sort of a um, an homage to to their work. Oh, an homage, but it, it's very cohesive, very synergistic. There's well, thank th- you. there's yeah. a, a great synergy between the photographer and the photo- and the style and the photographs themselves. Uh, and each one, as I said, it's very distinctive, so that you know, it, it doesn't all get lumped together. It's not a blur to anybody watching that it's just, oh, people taking more pictures. This is so far from that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's certainly the hope. And I and I think that, you know, literally every tiny decision, I think in the end, you know, hopefully if it's the right decision, then combines to, to create something that, you know, that really is greater than the sum of its parts. And I think, you know, with, for instance, with, Donna's episode, you know, the, we, we chose, we felt it was important to shoot her interview in her home. You know, she, she's mm-hmm. talking about domestic violence and home being a safe yeah. haven as it, you know, most people think of it as that and should be able to think of it as that. But here, you know, she is in her own home and she's surrounded by all these images, these memories um, that she's captured in other people's homes that have been diverted and turned mm-hmm. into sort of war zones, as she puts it. Yeah. Um, so there was no, no better place, I think, than, than uh, her own home for that. So now that this initial series of conflict, and for those, for the listeners out there, you can watch all of these, go to thisisconflict.com. 
Um, where will where will you now go from here with the series? Will this be expanded? Uh, will you continue with it? Seek out more photographers? Yeah, we um, well we are doing everything we can with the series now. I mean, it is um, it's done very well on Vimeo, um, which is uh, the, the partner that we're using for the distribution of the videos. Um, a couple of the videos have been, a couple of the episodes have been staffed by, by, by Vimeo and their staff in general just, just loves the series. And um, and then we also have developed a, a partnership with The Atlantic, uh, and The Atlantic is releasing each episode, uh, one episode per week over six weeks, um, starting last week, so they released the second today. Mm-hmm. Um and uh, and that's great because we we just feel like their audience is is a really good fit for for this content. But we're trying to get it out as widely as possible, and we are definitely uh, interested in continuing the series. We're in talks right now with a handful of different networks about going forward with a, a fully serialized 60-minute version of the show, which um, may involve the same. Uh, uh, photographers in, in season one and uh, it may not but um, but there's a pretty good chance that at least some of mm-hmm. them would be involved um, and um, so we're, we're very excited about that possibility oh well I I can't get enough of this and I think that the public at large it's very eye-opening on so many levels and it really shines a spotlight on the unsung heroes out there that really do tell the stories of our world yeah, well, thank you very much. I mean, I think, you know, there there are lots of reasons why we we um, we feel this is this was and is an important uh, subject to explore and, and to and to distribute as widely as possible. Um, you know, and and I've mentioned some of them you know, already, but I think one other that I that I haven't mentioned yet is just that it's it's so different. Um, it's such a different way of understanding these kinds of events. And, and I think that what makes it different in my view is that it's very personal. Um, and I think unfortunately that's something that, that um, the way that we disseminate news for the most part, it, you know, it gets away from that. And I think there are certainly reasons um, why uh, most news outlets strive for objectivity, for instance. But I think it's, it really is valuable to, to sort of remember that we are all, in the end, human beings, and these things that are happening are, are perpetrated by and happening to other human beings just mm-hmm. like us. And if we can somehow identify with that, um, with that humanity, which I think pieces like this and stories from, from photographers who are really living it, you know, I think that that can happen, and, and I think that has huge value. Well, I think conflict is certainly on its way to opening up the eyes of a lot of people. And I can't wait. I, I sincerely hope this expands into an ongoing series, a 60-minute six, a series, because it is, it is truly, it is moving, it's powerful, it's very impactful. Um, and I'm so thankful that you actually did something like this. Thank you. Very, very much. And I, and I also just should also um, not go through a huge long list, but just, I mean, it's uh, obvious, I, I would imagine, but certainly in things like uh, projects like this, there are a huge number of people who uh, played a very large role in making making it happen. And um, My series co-producer, Rob Shore, is a, is a very, very big part of that. Um, many other members of the team, editors and sound designers and mixers and um and uh, I mean, even you know, the funding initially for uh, for the series, I mean, which came from National Geographic, all of that is just invaluable. Well, I can't thank you enough for joining me on Behind the Lens today, Nick. This has been a real treat, and I do hope that you will that you will call in again, and uh, we can stay advised and apprised of where this story is going and where other Red Fits projects are. Because uh, you got you, you're always doing something over there. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, I actually just at the same time I'm releasing another uh, a feature documentary, 60 minute film. So there's always a lot going on. And um, as you mentioned, people can see all these episodes for free at 
This is conflict.com, and, and from that uh, website, it's easy to, to check out some, at least, of, of the other projects, including that, that new feature documentary, which is called Starboard Light, by the way. And pretty good for the holidays. Very different from uh, <laughs> Yes. Does a house make a family, or does uh, the family make the home? It, are you asking? <laughs> I'm, I'm asking. Is that what we're well, going Will we find that out in Starboard Light? I, yeah, I, I think you will, but you're going to come to your own conclusion. Okay. And I don't think, I think the point is, the point of the question is it's not quite so obvious. Well, I'm definitely going to check that one out. And after I see it, I'm going to bother Karen. I'm going to tell her I want to get you back on the show so we can talk about Starboard Light. All right. Nick, thank you so much. Thank you, Debbie. Bye-bye. Have a great holiday. You too. Bye-bye. And that was Nick Fitzhugh, who is one of the producers, showrunner uh, of Conflict. This is Conflict.com. And we're almost out of time today, but we have time to do one more Hateful Eight clip today. We're going to jump ahead to clip number four for Quentin Tarantino. I'm giving Brian signals. Um, Quentin likes, as we all know from his films, he will set things in, in, the, in periods or in fantastical situations in order to express his commentary on the world today. And that is something that he does quite well here with Hateful Eight. When you try to deal... I'm not saying it's a bad thing to do, but when you try to deal with uh, um, prescient themes in the present, uh, you know, you're, that is what you're doing. You know, that is the railroad you're building, and that's where, and that's where that train is going. And you know, that, that can actually be fantastic. We can all point at uh, uh, versions in uh, cinema history that, that has been profound. Um, I do like putting scenario first. I do like putting story first. And I actually like... Uh, uh, masking whatever I want to say in the guise of genre so I can say it with my left hand and then deal with the right hand with the genre dictates. Um, however, in that, in this instance per se, uh, or in particular, I guess is, uh, what I meant, is um, it's one of the benefits of the Western genre. I think there's no other genre that has dealt, that deals with America better uh, uh, in its uh, in a subtextual way than uh, the westerns uh, being made in the in the different uh, decades, i.e., like the fifties westerns, very much uh, uh, put forth uh, an Eisenhower idea of America and an American exceptionalism aspect of it, where the westerns of the seventies were very cynical about America, and uh, the one of the you know um, it it was a drag that that first draft of the script got out when it did, <laughs> however. As we were making this movie was during that last year and a half where many of the themes that we were dealing with, we were watching on television when we got home and we would come to the set and we would talk about them. But the one good thing about the script getting out there as soon as I'm on record for having written this before all the started popping off in the last year and a half. <laughs> so, and of course with Quentin, yes, there's going to be a beep. So that's just about it for today and for 2015. I thank all of you who have joined us as our audience has grown all year long. Uh, we are on iTunes. We are live every Monday here on AdrenalineRadio.com from 11 to 12 uh, Pacific Time, 2 to 3 Eastern Time. And uh, you can find us on Facebook, Behind the Lens on Facebook. You can email us, uh, btlradio at prodigy.net. And all of this you can find on our lovely little video package when Jordan edits it and it's up later in the week. So tune in again on January 4th, 2016. We uh, already have guests lined up for the whole month of January uh, for it coming at you. And we'll also hear about more on Hateful Eight. We're going to hear some behind the lens and below the line on The Revenant and on a Carol. So, until 2016, may the Force be with all of you, and go see Star Wars again, go see Point Break, go see Hateful Eight, go see The Revenant, go to the movies. There's nothing like it. <laughs>